Put simply, administrative acts are binding or constraining edicts that come not through law, but along other pathways. For example, when an agency issues a rule constraining Americans, barring types of pollution or perhaps land use, this is an attempt to exercise binding legislative power not through an act of Congress, but through an administrative edict. And similarly, when an agency adjudicates an administrative violation, let's say imposing a fine or some other penalty, this is an attempt to exercise binding judicial power, not through a judicial act, but again through an administrative edict. Now leave aside for a moment whether these administrative edicts are unlawful. What makes them administrative is that they bind Americans not through law, nor through the decisions of courts of law, but through other mechanisms. So you can think of administrative power as, well, off-road driving, right? The Constitution generally authorizes two avenues of binding power, acts of Congress and acts of the courts. But the executive prefers to drive off-road, not through statutes and judicial acts, but along other administrative paths. And for those in the driver's seat, this off-road driving is exhilarating. For the rest of us, however, it's, it's a little unnerving. This understanding of administrative power in terms of binding edicts excludes, note, lots of executive action. So when I complain about administrative law, my complaint is not about government benefits or privileges. It's not about welfare or social security. And the complaint is not about orders to officers within their executive authority, for example, in distributing welfare. There could be problems there. This is not what this is about. Instead, the administrative law problem consists of attempts to bind or constrain Americans legislatively or judicially through acts other than those of Congress and the courts. On this understanding of administrative power, administrative law is a constitutional puzzle. Now, of course, our government is full of puzzles, and perhaps more so with every decade as we get more and more decisions from the courts, not to blame anyone in particular, but uh, our, you know, None of these puzzles are as serious as administrative power. The immediate puzzle is that administrative power does not match the powers authorized by the Constitution. The Constitution, of course, authorizes three types of power, legislative power in Congress, executive power in the president and its subordinates, and judicial power in the courts. What then is administrative power? Is it a fourth sort of power? It's often said so by some of my colleagues. But then how is it constitutional? My talk today will lay out two possible answers, both framed in terms of history. The first conventional and rather sunny view of the history uh, is that administrative law is a modern development. This conventional vision emphasizes the modernity of it all. There are many doctrinal justifications of administrative power, and we can talk about them later. My book goes into considerable detail about them. But the foundational justification is that administrative power is modern or novel, and so it's without much depth of history. From this perspective, administrative power begins around 1887, when Congress creates the Interstate Co Commerce Commission. Administrative power then repeatedly expands every several decades, in the early 1900s, 1930s, 1970s, and again now. A variant of this conventional sunny view comes from Jerry Mashaw at Yale, who suggests that administrative power began to develop a little earlier in the early practices of the federal government. But even this maintains the gist of the standard version, which is that at some point or another, after the founding of the Constitution, we get administrative power. Whether the conventional vision begins in the 1790s or the 1880s, the argument is that it developed since 1789 as a pragmatic response to the practical problems of American life. Sounds very reassuring, right? And although, so, although not mentioned in the Constitution, administrative law allegedly was, and these are quotations from Landis, an indigenous and empirical growth, which necessarily arose to deal with, again, our practical, pragmatic realities of American life. The conventional vision thus becomes an apology for administrative power. Sociologically, the message is one of modernity and necessity. Administrative law is a modern type of power necessary to handle the complexity of modern society, and so it's anti-modern and quixotic to resist it. I guess that makes me anti-modern and quixotic, but I guess that's not news either, is it? Constitutionally, the message is that administrative law developed after the adoption of the Constitution, and so it could not have been anticipated by the Constitution. And therefore, even if it's not amongst the powers authorized by it, it's a necessary and modern addition. Again, a reassuring story, 
if you believe it. The justificatory implications are very powerful. In this conventional vision of the history, post-constitutional necessities just slice through the tripart division of powers in the Constitution. In the standard vision, Pragmatic necessity for the executive to exercise all powers of government allows it to combine legislative, judicial, and executive power. Uh, in this pragmatic vision, moreover, well, you don't really need judges and juries, right? Just have the executive decide. Indeed, an agency can be a prosecutor, judge, and jury. And in the standard vision, pragmatic, pragmatic necessity avoids the need for all of the procedural rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. On the theory that it all can be reduced to administrative process. Or as the line goes, you know, this is all the process that is due. You get out of court and suddenly you don't need due process, and so forth. But there are problems with this conventional vision, and the most basic question concerns its historical accuracy. Is it true that administrative law is modern, post-constitutional, and American development? Is it true that the Constitution could not have anticipated administrative law and therefore did not prohibit it? Ultimately, the conventional vision doesn't dig deep enough, I think. It is a cheerful, breezy vision of history in which the past is not examined very closely in all the sweetness and light. So let's turn to a second vision of the history, which looks below the surface of the usual apologetics and points, I think, to a dark and very dangerous past. In fact, administrative power revives absolute power. Rather than a modern necessity, it is a version of a recurring threat one inherent in human nature and the temptations of power. The constitutional history of the last thousand years records the repeated ebb and flow of absolutism on the one side and of law on the other. And there always have been pressures for the absolutism, and law only sometimes has been able to resist. So during the next 10 minutes, let's examine the history of absolute power. And as I recount it, please think about the modern parallels. I will may be talking about medieval or 17th century English history and their kings, but you should be thinking about contemporary presidents. We need to begin with prerogative power. English kings were widely expected to rule through law. They had parliament for making law and courts of law for adjudicating cases. And kings were expected to govern through the acts of these bodies. Thus, to bind their subjects in general, they had to seek acts of parliament. And to bind their subjects in particular cases, they had to seek the acts of law courts. But kings, of course, were often discontent with governing through law. They wanted control, more control than they could get when relying on their legislature and judicial acts. And so they therefore often acted on their own, not through law, but through royal or prerogative power. The power ordinarily exercised through law thus was evaded when kings acted through prerogative power. Prerogative power thus was, you could say, the predecessor of administrative power. Prerogative power was the personal power of kings. Administrative power is the bureaucratized power of the state. But otherwise, they're very similar. Both have been evasions of law. Consider these prerogative evasions, and they should sound familiar if you know anything about administrative evasions. Ordinarily, kings bound their subjects through statutes. But with their prerogative power, they bound them through proclamations or decrees what we call rules and regulations. Ordinarily, kings repealed old statutes by obtaining new statutes. But through their prerogative power, they issued prerogative dispensations and suspensions, what we call waivers. Ordinarily, kings could enforce law only through the courts of law. But with prerogative power, they enforced their extra legal commands in their own prerogative courts, king's council, star chamber, high commission. We have the equivalent of these. They're called our administrative agencies. Ordinarily, the kings had to work through courts of law with the due process of law. But in their prerogative courts, they could use civilian inquisitorial process, what we call administrative process. Ordinarily, kings resolved disputes about royal power. Sorry, ordinarily, the judges resolved disputes about royal power. But on account of the prerogative power, kings expected deference from the judges. They expected deference to prerogative regulations to prerogative interpretations of statutes, and to prerogative fact-finding. And interestingly, though, unlike today, the judges then generally refused to defer. Last but not least, prerogative power evaded English divisions of power. Although the English did not yet have a full separation of powers, they had a basic division of powers. Parliament made law, the courts adjudicated it, the king exercised force. 
Nonetheless, when kings act through their prerogative power, they or the prerogative courts exercise all government powers. For example, the Star Chamber made regulations, <clears throat> prosecuted infractions, and adjudicated them. It sounds just like a modern agency. Evidently, prerogative power was a means of evading government through law. It was a way of exercising it outside the law. And just as kings evaded law with prerogative power, the executive now evades it law with administrative power. 